Welcome to Deep Look, Ulti World's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor of Ulti World, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me, Ulti World senior editor Keith Rayner. Keith, it's uh, we got a lot of sports going on right now. We are on the precipice of the NBA playoffs. I just want to give a big hearty screw you to the Knicks haters out there who were naysaying at the beginning of the season. I mean, I was getting people were killing me for betting the Knicks over on the win total. And here they are in the playoffs. And Keith, we might just play the Hawks in the playoffs. Are you ready for that? I, I am. And, you know, all it took was playing Julius Randle 98 minutes a night. Uh, I'm sure it'll bear. I'm sure that'll bear fruit. Come the the long road. The, the, the hate continues. The hate continues. I hear from <laughs> well, you. Right well, if you're going to frame your team against mine, I got to I got to step up the hate, right? Like I got to like turn the dial up on the on the venom. Well, let's just understand that the Knicks are three and zero this season against the Hawks. So it's the regular season, you know. It, it's, it's okay. Sweep incoming sweep. Oh, oh, I, I will take the sweep bet if you want. <laughs> we can give some odds on the sweep bet. Um. It's also the today is the start of the WNBA season. So go Liberty. Sabrina Ionescu back. Devastating start to the year last year. She gets hurt season ending injury like almost immediately. So sad. It was terrible. But like, you know, renewed hope uh, this year. I'm rocking the Liberty uh, shirt today. So I'm, I'm excited for the uh, start of the year. I I can't hate there. I mean, I'm I was really excited to see uh, INSQ play last year, and hopefully uh, we get get a better better and longer look at one of the most talented women to to pick up the basketball. As of today, we are three weeks away from the start of the AUDL season, and I think you know it's fair to call that the return of competitive ultimate in the United States. Uh, it has been a long road to get here and, you know, looks like club season is pretty much on track. We have the AUDL starting up. We have plans from the PUL and the WUL to play. Uh, you know, it's it's still going to be a strange season, but at least on the AUDL front, it sounds like, you know, we're, we're getting set for a full competitive year. They just announced their uh, new stadium. Uh, for the championship weekend, the Audi Field in Washington, D.C., 20,000-seat stadium. It's right off the metro, so you can take public transportation to the game, which I think is not something that's really been possible for past championship weekends. Um, We're going to talk a lot about the AUDL in next week's show, uh, but uh, so we'll set that aside and kind of take a look at the season preview next week. Uh, a kind of high level look at where things stand. But uh, today we've got uh, we got some small ball. We got a kind of a, a bunch of different topics to get to. I just want to give a quick shout out. Check out the new Ulti World podcasts. Laying it out has now been out for uh, a few weeks. I was actually just on the show this past week uh, with Scotty in Pockets and huh. uh, highly recommended. I mean, I would say it's basically a college ultimate focused show, but. Uh, they've had a, a a broad range of topics to discuss, and you can find it on YouTube or wherever. Char- you Charlie get your appears on the show, and then suddenly uh, really wants you to go look at it. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I, I I have nothing to say. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I, I'm I know I've already mentioned it on the show, so at I know, least I'm I have that. Um, and I learned week, something about you in that show. By the way, there were things about that. I there was things that I did not know about Charlie that I learned from the Laying It Out podcast. What, so what's what's something that too. do you remember? One of those things? Oh, I a hundred percent do know what it was. Musical theater major, huh? I considered it at NYU. I considered it. I I never actually got through the full application, but I was definitely considering it. I feel like you were hiding something from me. I mean, <laughs> this is a big piece of information. I I almost tried out for uh, a musical group, like a theater group in uh, my first year of college, like to the point of like I walked into the theater to uh, perform wow. a number from well, then you uh, bailed from Guys and Dolls or something. And then I was like, nah, I'm good. Well, because I think they were doing Into the Woods, which is like one of my favorite musicals and a musical I had already been in. So I was like, all right, this is just perfect. And then uh, I was going to go in and try out. And then I was like, nah, I don't want to do this. since I'm, I got too much, too much nerves going on. I'm just going to leave. Yeah, I mean, I, I I was in chorus starting in seventh grade all the way through my senior year of high school, 
and uh, I was Jean Valjean in Les Mis junior Ooh. year, and then I was Tony in West Side Story senior year. So like you know, I was like fairly serious about it late in high school, uh, but I still I'm glad that I didn't I didn't have the chops, so I didn't go it. But anyway, I feel like the idea of Ulti World the musical could have a lot of legs as a meme. <laughs> like I feel like we could get memed uh, long term as Ulti World the musical. We- we have some very creative people, some some great singers in the you know Ulti World universe. So. Certainly, some performers, if not singers, then performers at least. Indeed. Um, another new podcast coming out starting this coming week. Y- you can already find it in podcast feeds. Huck and A. Yeah, you heard me right. Huck and A. Uh, it's a brand new Canadian podcast. Theo Wan, Danny Proby hosting that one, and uh, focusing all on Canadian Ultimate. So. Shout out to shout out to the uh, new Huck and A podcast, laying it out as well. And uh, hey, if you ever have a podcast idea, shoot it over to us, editor at ultiworld.com, or you can email me and Keith, deeplook at ultiworld.com. Um, so Keith, I- I'm sure you saw the news. CDC guidance changed yesterday. Vaccinated people now don't have to wear masks in pretty much all circumstances except a couple of specific, you know, very crowded public places. But uh, the guidance now that, you know, if you're vaccinated, you you don't have to wear a mask even if you're inside in many cases. So, you know, before we get to the kind of the connection to Ultimate, you know, what was your reaction on hearing that news? It's funny that, you know, my, my Ardula, who like is a birth consultant, basically, uh, was coming over to visit with me and my wife, like basically as that news broke. And like, so she was like at the front door and she was saying like, do I need to be mask on or mask off? Mask off. And it was like, well, funny enough, the CDC literally just said that given that all three of us are vaccinated, we may not actually need a mask given how short the duration of this visit is going to be. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a funny experience, but it, I guess it feels like you know, that has been the trend especially as vaccination has become more prominent, there's going to be a larger amount of people who are affected by a decision like this. And also that as more people got vaccinated, there were going to be more questions about, okay, now that I'm vaccinated, what is what is the proper precaution for me? What is safe for the people around me who may not be vaccinated? And with those questions, you know, I think it, it kind of behooved the CDC to come forward with kind of like, here's the guidance given this changing situation. That has been how this process has worked. There's been a constant shift in recommendations because the situation is constantly changing. So I'm glad to see that they were at least like coming forward and and making a clear statement so that people knew what to do uh, and what the safest course of action would be. Yeah, I mean, I've been unimpressed with public health messaging throughout this whole pandemic. Uh I, I'm glad the CDC has come out and kind of made what I consider to be more of a common sense approach to talking about what it means once you're vaccinated. Because if you actually look at the data around what happens when you're vaccinated, like the risk of contracting COVID is very low. The risk of contracting severe COVID is almost non-existent. Uh, and so what exactly is the purpose of getting vaccinated if you then have to continue to wear a mask everywhere you go? Um, it it never really made sense for that to be the guidance. I mean, we were looking just a couple of weeks ago. They're talking about how if you're vaccinated, but you're still close to people outside, you have to wear a mask. Like it, it never made sense. So now they've kind of swung in the other direction and basically said, well, if you're vaccinated, you're pretty much good to go, which, you know, I've seen now some criticism on the other side that like that's there it's too uh unrestrictive that now it's too lenient and i i think that people really just need to be told what the truth is i think we've had a lot of problems with public health messaging being uh kind of untruthful to some extent because of concerns about how you know like the the knock on effects of like well that's going to cause unvaccinated people to take unnecessary undue risks. Um, But, you know, as a result, we've had, I think, kind of misinformation getting promulgated at times around what it means to be vaccinated. So anyway, that's just, you know, some personal thoughts there. I mean, I certainly 
feel a lot more comfortable now that I'm vaccinated, being inside with other people, uh, going to eat at a restaurant, kind of resuming life, not fully normal, you know, you're still wearing a mask at many times, but feeling a lot more comfortable and, and not worrying really about getting COVID. And I, to be to, to respond to something that you, that you just mentioned about the misinformation, like I don't know that there's a way, given the cultural climate that we exist in, for the CDC to necessarily avoid that or, or or even mitigate that. You know, whatever they were going to say was probably going to be misused or attacked or whatnot sure, by a sure. certain subsection of people who want to spread misinformation. And it's really unfortunate that the CDC. And the general like behavior of wearing masks has been so politicized. You know, even I found myself, I was with my father in law. We were taking some stuff to the town like dump, basically. We had some bulk items left over from a move and they needed to get rid of them. And he had forgotten his mask and they let him in without a mask. And I found myself like thinking about like, wow, I wonder if this makes it look like we're the type of people who just don't care about other people's safety and right. we're like, you know, oh, it's my right to not wear, you know, whatever garbage logic people wanted to use to to avoid a minor inc inconvenience that was a public health benefit. Like, I found myself thinking about how are people perceiving us, uh, even though only one of us didn't have a mask. But uh, it's it's there's all these feelings and perceptions wrapped up in the behavior of wearing a mask and following public health advice from the CDC that like now you're in a much more complicated situation if you're a public health expert or even just a normal person trying to respond to public health missives. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you just think back, you know, sort of the people who are really focusing on like the latest research and science, we're talking about things like ventilation and the danger of, you know, sort of unventilated indoor spaces as being the primary mechanism for the transmission of COVID back last summer. And yet that was not the mainstream media conversation. You know, there's still pictures of people on the beach, uh, you know, with the Grim Reaper walking around. And y you just wonder, like, how how much how much unnecessary confusion around what is safe and what is not happened because of the lack of clarity from public health experts. Um, so anyway, we don't need to get into the to the weeds on all that on today's show. Speaking of minor inconveniences of wearing a mask, the USA Ultimate Return to Play guidelines currently require for all uh, sanctioned events that players wear masks at all times, including during competition. And with this news, and just with the general pace of vaccinations increasing, I think there are starting to be some more questions about, is a mask mandate still necessary given that, you know, there's widespread vaccine availability and, you know, Ultimate is played outdoors in obviously sort of a, a maximally ventilated environment. So, Keith, I'm curious for your take on this question. You know, is is a mask mandate still the right approach for USA Ultimate? And, you know, at what point should we should should USAU say it's no longer required to wear a mask during play? Now, now to be clear, I've I've not played with a mask on. So I don't know what that experience is like and how it impacts your performance, your health, your safety, or your enjoyment of the experience of playing ultimate. So I'm coming from the perspective of having not competed with the mask on yet. Um, all, all that said, you know, like, like I said, to me, I view wearing a mask as a minor inconvenience. And one of the challenges I think USA ultimate faces is that they don't, the, they can basically only estimate what percentage of the playing population is vaccinated based on sure. the general population's vaccination rate. Oh, and wow. they don't really have a way to ensure or follow up on that were there to be an incident uh under their under their watch. And I think that 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 leads to a very conservative decision making path. And I, I I can understand where that comes from even if it doesn't feel necessary. In part because I view the cost of wearing a mask while playing as very low. It's it's generally not a big challenge. And I think we've seen people in our discussions, you know, there's been a discussion in our discord going on about this. Uh, you know, I've seen people talk about particularly that there is a specific situation in ultimate 
that could be potentially problematic. And that's marking a person talking very loudly, almost directly in your face uh, while defending you. You know, that, that is a situation that, you know, gets past some of the ventilation issues that maybe you would be dealing with in, in a normal outdoor performance space. Sure. So, you know, you can't, you can't necessarily have people like have a mask around their neck and then put it up whenever they're marking. Maybe you could, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's the answer. I don't know. Um, but I can see given the CDC stance, USA ultimate soon putting out a mask recommendation for people who feel like they need one or have not been vaccinated rather than a mandate. Like there is a bar between mandated mask usage, no recommendation for masks. There is space between that. And that's what I would expect USAU to go to. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a, a very sort of tricky policy decision because of what you're describing. You know, I, I don't think a vaccine passport is coming anytime soon to Ultimate, uh, where, you know, USAU is going to check your vaccine st vaccination status and then it'll let you play without a mask if you're vaccinated. So in a world in which you're sort of guessing now, I, I don't know if I agree with the general population vaccination rate matching ultimate. I mean, you think about the ultimate demographics, generally college educated, generally on the wealthier side, uh, you know, generally younger. I expect that vaccination rates are going to be quite a bit higher than, you know, sort of general population. Um, and so, you know, regardless, you're still going to have some level of uncertainty about those who are unvaccinated. But at some point, if people are choosing not to get vaccinated, and we're basically at that point now, with some exceptions, people are then opting not to get a vaccine, even though they have access to it. At what point do you, you know, stop worrying about that subset of the population? I mean, you, you can't, we're not going to have mask mandate forever. So I, what I want to see from USA Ultimate is a plan around when the mandate will go away. How, at, at what point do you say we're not going to have the mandate anymore? Because, you know, by the time the club season gets started in, you know, I think the first week of June and sort of the big travel tournaments don't even kick on for another six weeks after that, people will have had ample opportunity at that point with some, you know, again, potential rare exceptions to get a vaccine. So it, it doesn't, I, I personally don't think it makes a lot of sense to require everybody to be wearing a mask. If, if somebody's risk averse enough, even after vaccination, to feel that they, you know, are concerned even outdoors about getting COVID, they can still wear a mask, right? It's not like you, you suddenly masks are disallowed. Anybody can wear a mask if they want to wear a mask, but a mandate to do so is maybe going to be unnecessary. It may already be unnecessary in my mind, uh, given where things stand in the, you know, so the vaccination progress of the United States. So, so go, go ahead. And then I have, well, so I, I have a question. So, so my understanding, and, and, and I, I feel like you're a little more, have a little more research background on, on uh, COVID infection rates and some of the behaviors around it. Mask wearing is generally used as a way to prevent spreading COVID, not to prevent, being infected with COVID. Is that, is that fair? It's more to yeah, impact the people around you than it is to protect you from them. I, I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment. It depends on the mask type, but that that's generally a fair assessment. So if you're, if you're a risk averse person worried about contracting COVID, wearing a mask is not necessarily the behavior that would help prevent that, that would help you from spreading COVID. What you would want in that situation is everybody else to wear a mask. Right. Sure. And I, if you're dealing with a, a, if you're still worried about some subsection of the population that is choosing not to not to get vaccinated, then those people participating without a mask, that is a problem versus everybody else wearing a mask to protect themselves from the person who won't be vaccinated. But but here's the thing. If you're vaccinated, you shouldn't be afraid of people who have covid. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you, you know, you want to actively sit inside a room with them and have them breathe on you. But like the point of getting vaccinated is that now you are not at risk of or, or at very, very low risk of contracting COVID and all, all, basically a zero risk of severe illness or death. 
So the, the thing is, there's a there's a known cost with having to wear a mask. I have played masked ultimate. It's fine, but it's uncomfortable. And it gets more uncomfortable if you're playing hard. Um, and there have been various studies. It's a little bit unclear whether there's an actual performance detriment from wearing a mask. There have been studies that have shown a drop in like aerobic capacity in VO2 max. But there are there's also a sense that potentially it's just in your head. Um, but, you know, having having played with a surgical mask on, it definitely feels uncomfortable. And like when you really want to catch your breath, there's a strong urge to pull your mask down. So I, I guess the thing is like, there's already such a low baseline risk of transmission outdoors, number one. Right. Number two, we have almost no cases, like literally at all known of outdoor sports transmission, including in NFL football. Um, and, and this is kind of just like a, a background thing, right? If you're talking about playing indoors, to me, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, but with, you know, outdoor warm weather ultimate happening in the club season in the summertime, in my mind, like that is already such a generally safe environment that, and I, I will fully admit, we have no way of knowing like what the risk level of marking is. It's more theoretical than anything else. Like, right. yes, you're a hundred percent right. Being in somebody's face where like I could spit droplets into the person that I'm marking's mouth or something like that. That is in theory, that's a, that's a risky scenario. The thing is we have almost no evidence that that kind of transmission is actually happening without being like really close in a way that I think that, you know, typically doesn't happen on the mark. Time, time for everybody to do the reverse mark, but, but towards <laughs> the person you're marking. Uh, simple, simple I've solutions seen, I've seen to simple get problems. D's with that, <laughs> uh, I, I would. I also wouldn't be surprised to see USA Ultimate. I think probably for the worse, going to a, a more like localized, like follow your local recommendations kind of tact, which I don't think is necessarily what local discords need. Like they already know to do that. Like they're already looking at their local recommendations. Uh, and certainly the the in betweens college teams trying to have a practice or you know something like that a club team trying to practice like I don't I don't think they're going to benefit a lot from that but I I wouldn't be super surprised if USA Ultimate went to the like you know look at your local guidelines to get an idea of what you should be doing uh, if that was the path they chose. Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's a tricky spot to be in. I think again I my hope is that USA Ultimate sets out a plan for when they would lift the mandate. So whether that's a date or a level of COVID transmission in the United States, you know, cases have, are at the lows from last summer already, and they've been going down for, you know, six weeks. So at, at, I think at some point you have to say, we're now comfortable with the risk here. And if people still choose to wear a mask, that's totally fine. But, you know, if it, it feels a little silly to be outdoors vaccinated wearing a mask while playing sports. It really does. Well, not, don't tell that to Dalton Smith. Got rocking him. the uh, <laughs> rocking the necky. Because I don't know if this is all 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 like uh, positive for him. He's like, sweet. Now everybody's in the same boat. Or is it worse? Because it's like I'm losing my swag. You know. I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Um, it, it's a, it's an interesting conversation. You know, the it's not an easy answer either direction. There's just there's a lack of data on you know well what happens in in a marking situation what is the risk and that's been it's a challenge a of the duration. entire pandemic i mean trying right. to research something that's literally happening <laughs> uh is really difficult and so i think we've we've had a lot of situations like that you know having a, a, my wife be pregnant during this process it's like Right. Do we know if the vaccine is safe for pregnant women not really we don't really know is there long term effects that could could happen who knows? Like for pregnant or non-pregnant people, we don't know because the vaccine was just invented. So how are we going to know what the long-term effects are? Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of questions like that. I think that are difficult because it's so hard to research on such a short timeline. Well, let us know your thoughts. Deep look at ultiworld.com. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to play some small ball. Stay with us. Hey, 
Hey, it's Keith Rayner from Ulti World's podcast, Deep Look, and I want to tell you about Elevate Ultimate. Elevate is a youth-focused dish sports organization based out of Vancouver, Canada, that is leading the way in helping kids discover and flourish in disc sports. And they've got a great new book, The Art of Coaching Youth Ultimate, that can help you do the same in your community, from how to recruit kids, to how to manage problematic behaviors, to running a practice. There's lots of great chapters with great content in the book, including one of my favorites, which is the one about making practices engaging for kids. You can find out more and check out the book for yourself, uh, either by searching The Art of Coaching Youth Ultimate at Amazon or by going to elevateultimate.com and checking under the resources tab. Thanks to Elevate for their support of Ulti World and Deep Look. Welcome back to Deep Look. Charlie, it's time for a little bit of small ball. And to bridge the gap, really, from the previous segment into small ball, I actually had a question for you. Do you think we will see any teams with team masks this season? Ooh, like the custom uh, team masks? Indeed. If if I was a team, I would have already done this. So, yes, I think we will. They're actually, you're probably right that somebody has probably beaten us to the punch. Like, these probably exist. There are probably team masks. You can definitely get, like, custom neckies. Now, you know, there was, like, the whole thing about neckies not being... Like, <laughs> there was that study from, like, last year that was horribly misinterpreted, and people were like... Wearing a necky is worse than wearing nothing, <laughs> yeah, uh, I which is that. just is completely wrong. <laughs> but like neckies fell out very much out of favor as like a face covering. Um, are, are, are we at the double necky phase? Is that the recommended? If you're going to wear a necky, you wear two or something like that. Is that accurate? I, I don't. I don't even know. I, I, I feel like you know we we understand the basic. Like if you want to really be safe, wear an N95. The next level down is a surgical mask. People should have stopped wearing cloth masks a long time ago, but it's been very difficult to find high quality masks on the market. Also, um, remor- just markedly more comfortable masks. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. Wearing an N95 is terrible. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think teams will will get the custom mask swag. I would. So that's basically our first item in small ball then. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into this rest of this. Um, Brand new team out of Dallas, Fort Worth area, Flash Flood. There's been some buzz. They've picked up some notable players. And uh, you know, we it, the South Central is a hotbed of solid teams that all that like compete really well at regionals and then lose to double wide and Bravo is Flash Flood in this same camp. Well, let's get to that in a second. First of all, Keith, tell us about this Flash Flood team. <laughs> well, uh, Flash Flood, I think it, by virtue of, of being like one of the only pieces of news going on, I think gained a lot of attention uh, as as a new club. And part of, part of, I think, the draw here is that it felt like they were taking away potential talent from the teams they could be competing with at regionals and you look at the list of names that of, you know, they, they did some public announcements on, on Twitter and whatnot. Uh, you know, you look at the, the bigger names perhaps on the team. Uh, Dylan Larberg is Gabe Hernandez, uh, Jason Hustad, Hustad, uh, Sam Suds Ward. You know, these are players who have some background playing with uh, some of the other teams in the area, like double wide, uh, with some of the teams in the AUDL. So these are players who who have some good experience behind them. But I, I think there there's gonna be a lot of questions about the depth of this roster and you know what exactly their ability is to to uh excuse the excuse the band phrase, but to make noise in the <laughs> South Central region. Keith, you're not allowed to just acknowledge that it's banned and then use it. <laughs> I mean, as a troll I am, but sure. <laughs> um yeah, no, it's, you know, lots of exciting young talent uh, pulling some players away from double wide. And like there's a, you know, this is kind of like bubbling under the radar to some extent. But 
this is like a a, a more progressive team uh, in a state where there's certainly compared to relative ultimate terms, there's like a lot more uh, you know right wing players, and so this seems to be a team that has focused a lot on being kind of of this new wave of you know equity focused. And I think we've seen that play out a little bit in some of the pickups. Uh, Gabe Hernandez explicitly talking about that when he signed up with the team. So I, I'm excited to see what this team can do. You know, they have some really promising young players. And I, I, I do think that it's still going to be a stretch for them to get past those big two. You know, we've seen Inception, for example, be a really good team for a really long time and not get to Nationals out of the South Central. This feels like a team that's going to be in a very similar position to an inception. Which of those teams is going to be the best in, you know, sort of the, the next best? I don't know. Uh, yeah, if you, I think you were the first person I heard bring this up, but like, does this feel like hip all over again? There was, there was a big, a lot of, a lot of uh, noise made about this hip team uh, when they first joined up, you know, they got Matt Bennett, like, could they, could they unseat one of the powerhouse teams and, and they make you know, it's a young team with a lot of talent and it's like it's a tough tough challenge to in your first year of existence overcome teams with a lot of institutional experience and things like that yeah I, i'm tr- i'm trying to remember if hip made nationals i think they made nationals one year they got a third bid i think um yeah i, I think it's similar it's you know, maybe there was a little bit more direct continuity with that hip team because, you know, it's out of Houston and there were lots of A&M players on the roster who'd been playing together in college for a long time. And they had some really top level, uh, you know, elite club talent, as does this flash flood team. I just think there's a lot of names that are either unproven or that we haven't seen play, uh, you know, at, at a high level in club. So, especially after a couple years off, what's that going to look like? Well, I mean, that's that's what makes it fun. I'm excited. It's great to have a new storyline right away in the season at a time when we're more, we unfortunately, have been more concerned about teams deciding not to compete this year as opposed to those, you know, new, new up and coming teams like this one uh, joining the ranks. I do think, I do think though, that you raise an interesting point with the team kind of have a different attitude you know, there, there's been no secret about Gabe Hernandez's friction with some of the existing entities in the club ultimate scene there, uh, in, in, in Texas and South Central, uh, Colton Green as well. And I think that, you know, seeing those players as some of the, the most visible players on this team could be a signal of a shift, uh, in the culture of ultimate in that area. And will that, you know, have long term ramifications? for how club teams uh, function, where the talent goes, where recruiting is, you know, it might not have to be that flash flood has to go out and, you know, supersede the double wides and bravos of the area in order to be successful this year. If they can just have a good year and build the foundation, it could lay the tracks for those other teams kind of fall by the wayside as they continue to recruit young talented who's interested in being a part of a different type of team than the the type that we've seen in the past few years. Yeah, something to follow along with. And uh, we're going to have a story coming out soon about this Flash Flood team. So keep an eye out for that as well. Can I, wonder can if, I, can I say about yes, Flash Flood? Of course. At the, at, the risk, at the risk of getting myself in a little bit of trouble here. Not, not this first part. First part. <laughs> so on their, on their team announcement, Flash Flood has an exclamation point in it. Flash Flood, exclamation point, ultimate. Okay. Which is not present on their on their Twitter account. I really hope that's not the case. I'm like really over just punctuation, in the punctuation. Of team names. We don't need it because then when we write it in a sentence, you know, it's flash flood exclamation point like wham. I'm like the, done. I'm done with it too. I, I can't deal with it. So yeah, please we had don't to deal do with that. this with shame for all these years. I think I think we're gonna have to make a policy that you know if you have random punctuation in your name, it we're gets just left we're out. ignoring it. I'm, I'm it for just, this. I'm for this. It looks so bad. It's really bad. Uh, but also it's it's a little weird to name your team after like a natural disaster in 2021, isn't it? Right? Like a thing that like like hurts people, kills people, th- removes them from their homes. I don't know. I think it's a little weird in in our know. current state, but maybe that's the part that'll get me in trouble. I th- I thought that was a little odd. I was like uh, I not to say that that that's like sweeping across all sports teams. There's plenty of 
hurricanes and the storm and the things like that out there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little weird to me. That's all. I think if you're allowed to, if you're allowed to be the hurricanes, then you can be flash flood. That's what I feel about. I, it. I don't know. It's just weird. It's weird. It's weird. I'm just saying. All right. Um, Callahan and Donovan awards, the annual college awards. Should they be handed out in 2021? Given that we're not going to have a regular season, we're kind of just getting straight into this kind of bonus series this fall and winter. Should there still be a Callahan and a Donovan award uh, given out this year, Keith? Yes, there should, Charlie. The reason is that these awards are more to me about a positive recognition of people who have contributed a lot during their college careers to the ultimate community and to their own own local communities. And we don't need a full regular season without an asterisk to give those people that type of recognition. Uh, so I do think that they should be, that the award should be given out. But I also think that it'll continue to contribute to the denigration of the meaning of the Callahan award. But, you know, we're already on that path. So like, why not just, why not just make sure that people feel good and are being recognized for their contributions to their, <laughs> to their local ultimate worlds. The denigration of the meaning. You're, 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 uh, you got some takes today. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I went to the dentist today. So like, you know, they get all up in your, up in your gums. It causes some pain and now I got to take it out somewhere else. You get the Novocaine or you just get a cleaning? Yeah, just a cleaning. Just a cleaning. Okay. Uh, look, I, I, I think they, they, they were given out in 2020, which was a partial season in which some teams didn't even compete. So why can't we get out in 2021? same situation and and here's the thing i want to have the 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 wikipedia entry be there for every year because there's a bunch of players who deserve to get recognized who are not you know who who are probably going to have a chance to play in this bonus tournament this bonus series and nationals coming up but aren't going to play in 2022 or beyond I feel like it's a great opportunity for those players to get recognized by their teams. And it's already a career award. That's what it's become. That's kind of what I was getting at. And and so what's the problem with doing it in a year where there's no regular season and you're not even really judging sort of like a MVP type performance in that particular season? So I I think it's just it's such a nice it's the best award you know, set of awards in in ultimate period. And so I think let's make sure and can give it out in, in 2021 as well. Wow. Best set of awards, huh? Not not gonna not gonna shout out our own ulti world awards as maybe the best set of awards. Well well I, I think that those are very important, but I'm talking about like those that are no, I at, at the end of the day, <laughs> I still think Callahan and Donovan are more prestigious and that's fine. I think they I, will be I, I, I agree with that. Then, uh, th- but I will say that I'm a little curious as to like kind of how it works. Like, if you vote in 2021, I mean, there are going to be players who probably don't play at all before the series. Uh, like, are those players eligible? Is if are do you just acknowledge that it's a career award this year? Do you just say yes. in the voting process like Didn't, this isn't is that not what they for did last year anyway? Season? Kind of right. I'm pretty sure they explicitly changed the rules in 2020 to make it more about career and less about the season so far. Oh, very prescient. You do the same thing. Here's what you do. <laughs> you wait until after nationals to have right. everybody vote. That's the thing is, do you vote after nationals? Do you have yes. to wait until nationals to 100%. vote this year? So 100%. That's an extra layer, uh, which you know maybe that's more legitimacy for the award. I don't know. <laughs> It'll be more fun to vote on it post nationals. Otherwise, Agreed. How? I mean, it's going to be like, old school RSD, like people Campaigns. talking about what happened at regionals. So-and-so was unstoppable at regionals. <laughs> oh, I miss, I miss the old RSD, uh, <laughs> all region, our all region threads. We had a couple of those on our forums, uh, the all region thread hyperbole. I miss that. Um, Nick emailed us at deep look at and he said, basically laid out the case for why WIFDIF should postpone the 2022 World Club Championships. 
So I'm not going to read the whole email because it's quite long, but I'll kind of like give you some highlights here. I, Nick Nick uh, is Australian, sent in an email to Wiftif kind of laying this out. He he writes, my big concern is that hosting the tournament in 2022 will result in it going forward up until a few months before and then canceling or postponing the event due to COVID. This is understandable and maybe a plan from the event organizers, which, you know, basically see if we can run it in 2022 and then if we can't cancel or postpone. The problem with this, however, he writes, is that athletes will start training, clubs will start planning for everything to happen and will be left in limbo waiting to see if it will all go ahead. I suggest instead moving the tournament to 2023, giving the whole tournament and all the athletes a better chance of peaking on time for a tournament that will actually have international teams be able to travel. Uh, I have to be honest, given the progress we made in vaccinations in the United States, I haven't given this a lot of thought because it feels like things are on a sort of progress towards normalcy here. But that is not the case everywhere. We are much further ahead in the U.S. with vaccinations than in many other parts of the world. So, Keith, do you think WIFDIF should preemptively say, wait a minute, we are going to postpone Worlds until 2023? That... It kind of feels like they it kind of feels like they have to to me in part because of the negative feelings around how Wift have handled some of their earlier pandemic cancellations you know we we I don't remember, know if you remember but we had that article about the danger of yellow lights yeah and that was going on both in Wift have and, and US USA ultimate just like kind of this perpetual state of limbo like this this stasis we were in as a community uh with like maybe we'll have this event but right now we're not committing to cancel it, canceling it but we're not committing to having it either and i think that's a lot more difficult with the scale of an international travel tournament like the ones that Wiftif hosts like the world ultimate club championships like that is a difficult situation to put teams in and we've already seen that create some friction with the financials, you know, collecting fees ahead of time, like reserving fields, all that kind of stuff. That's a that isn't is a much bigger stakes when you're talking about a world ultimate championship. So it kind of feels like this is something that the community they've kind of backed themselves into a corner. The WIFT has kind of been backed into a corner a little bit by by the community in my mind. Uh maybe that's overstating the impact of some of the earlier complaints, but uh it's it's not a rosy picture for me to imagine just kind of like putting things on hold a postponement. I mean, I'm going to go the other way here. I, I, I disagree with you. I, I think WIFDIF has to plan for events to resume in 2022. I mean, this is an organization that may not have a lot of full-time staff, but they have people they got to pay. They got to get ready to come back. And I think it would be a total disaster if they were to postpone today and then it turns out that it's totally fine to have the tournament next July. Uh, you know, look, is it a possibility that there's enough countries that are, you know, either unable to travel to the United States next summer or that, you know, vaccination progress is is too slow for them, you know, to get visas to come to the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, that is a possibility. I, 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 I think I generally trend towards more optimism on this front especially because you know places that are getting vaccinated now are going to kind of start reaching the limits of the people that want to get the vaccines and then those vaccines are going to go other places um and you know it's more production is coming online all the time uh i expect that you know let's be honest most of the countries that play at the world club championships are on the wealthier side and are going to have access to vaccines by then so I expect relatively normal international travel to be back online by 2022. So yeah, is it possible there's going to be a delay and that a lot of people are going to be upset? Yeah, I think, but I think you have to live with that, that up, that chance postponing now for an uncertain future doesn't make sense given how long it takes to kind of like prepare. It's so much easier to say, you know, in February, you know, never mind than it is to if you cancel now and then it, and then it could happen like you're setting back international ultimate by an entire year. That's a fair, fair counterpoint. And and, and you're right that summer 22 is, is, is a ways away. Like we have we have some time 
for things to settle out in that in that front. And we've talked about on the show before, it's a lot easier to cancel an event than it is to 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 prop one up all of a sudden. If you know, obviously it's out of the question basically if they are if they said we're canceling it and then 2022 summer July rolls around and they're like, never mind, we're good. Like you can't just throw the event together. Uh, but you could cancel it at that point. And this is a little bit different than you know some of the national team organizations that might be competing at like uh, WGC or something like that, where they need a much longer timeline, I think, uh, to create the team, to have tryouts, to gel together, that sort of thing. And that's a big part of the experience for many of the countries that compete in those, even though it is not part of the US experience, which is a much shorter timeline. These World Ultimate Club Championships teams, uh, it, it's a little bit different the logistics for them, and maybe that maybe that kind of flex adds flexibility that is necessary to make all of this work. So maybe you're right. Uh, maybe I was a little too harsh, but I do think that some of the missteps that Wiftif has had puts them in a position where it's hard for them to ask people to have a ton of faith in the process. Yeah, I, I hear that, and and I'll you know acknowledge Nick made another point in his email that he sent to Wiftif that you know teams need to host national qualifying events a task most countries will not be ready for due to covid for quite some time and we're already seeing that play out indeed we're seeing countries basically say well we're just going to revert to what happened in 2019 switzerland notably because we we can't have a championship due to covid and the united states where there's a whole plan for a full season and a club and a club championship USA Ultimate hasn't come out and said what the plan is going to be because they're not sure what to do. They don't want to coerce teams to play by having a qualifying, sort of normal qualifying procedure, you know, top three, four teams at nationals. So what are you going to do? I mean, are we just really going to have the event be based on what happened in 2019? That seems like a terrible uh, compromise. And, and so I, 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 you know, acknowledge Nick, Nick makes a good point there. I don't know what you do. I think, again... I th- I think it's more important to have an event than to have it be like uh you know sort of like perfect qualification process everything perfect um if you can have one in 2022 because we 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 have to get back playing again we have to like restart ultimate competition and you know frankly I think you should be more worried about beach worlds in April than you should be about the you know world club championships in July I definitely think it's fair to say that April 22 could is a is a much riskier proposition than July. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, thanks for the thoughtful email, Nick. Um, Ash Sadler, who used to go uh, by Lauren Sadler, has announced her retirement on Twitter. Sadler is, I mean, one of the winningest players in Club Ultimate. Like what? What I want to go through the stats. I think she I'll, made I'll the, seven the, straight the big, finals. The Is that numbers. right? Yeah, seven straight finals appearance from three across three different teams, winning four titles with those with those three teams. Wow, unbelievable! Um, and yeah, she's so she announced her retirement from uh, Ultimate, and uh, I mean it's just been an awesome career, and just want to give the shout out here. We asked Ash to come on the show and, um, you know, didn't didn't hear back. But, you know, maybe in the future we, we can have her on. Uh, but, uh, you know, tr- just a tremendous overall piece. Uh, do you think do you think that Ash was the straw that stirred the drink or it, was, was she in the right place at the right time? That's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that that Ash was a, a tremendous role player, like somebody who had a defined role as a top end defender and teams need that need players who can do that effectively, who don't require a ton of usage in order to make a big impact on the game. And, you know, I, I also, I've known Ash since college, uh, AU's finest, the finest, finest player out of American university. That's for sure. Uh, and, She's someone who really put in the work to get a lot better in all facets of her game, but like 
was always somebody you could count on to get a stop. And that type of that type of player has a role to play on nearly every team. Like, have you ever seen a team that couldn't use a player that could go out and play shutdown defense for a point in a big game? Like that's a that's a skill set that's going to get you a roster spot on any team in the world. Any team, especially being able to do it in the clutch, which is something we've seen a lot uh, from Sadler over the years. And I will say the announcement that it doesn't quite close the door. It's not. It's that not a. Fir- you know, we're not closing the door, lock and key here. No. Uh, she said, "I'm not playing this club season, and I'm probably not going to play in future years." And certainly, the tone of the the tone of the message, which thanks all the teams that she's been a part of, you know, implies that it's unlikely we're going to see her play again in a competitive setting. But we'll say that that it's not completely door shut here. And that'll be an interesting thing to see. You know, like some people are probably going to sit this year out for various reasons and you know maybe they refine the spark you know playing league or uh realizing that they miss their teammates I and mean, we've seen, certainly seen it happen before so uh we'll see i mean i think we're probably going to have some other notable retirements i mean it's been two years since club ultimate some people just got a little older you know <laughs> like cause and, some people and- are now masters eligible and are going to be like you know what i don't know if i want to go through the whole full club season thing again but that's that's one of the takeaways here, and something that we had talked about previously on the show is the possibility that people would just like it's not like Sadler couldn't hack it or that Sadler's too old. Like Ash Ash said, like I'm just choosing to move on to a different phase of my life. And I think we're gonna see people who, in their time away from Ultimate, discovered either other passions or saw how much Ultimate had taken from them, like how much how demanding it was to compete at a high level, and it would will choose to do other things with their time. And I think we're going to continue to see that. So I, I doubt this will be the last, but this could be the highest profile player that we see. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this week's show. Join us for our subscriber only bonus segment, ultiworld.com slash subscribe. You can sign up for less than $4 per month. And in our bonus segment this week, we are going to talk about, uh, we're going to draft four V four mini teams. Because remember, we got we got ultimate fours now, Keith. This oh, yeah. is a format. This is a thing. The it doesn't format, actually like seem to exist format? yet. There haven't been any tournaments or anything. But at some point, there's going to be an ultimate fours championship. And we are going to draft teams. So join us for that. And uh, we will look forward to talking with you next week right here on Deep Look.